Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's workshop. This is Michelle Jones, and I'm so excited to have our friends from Food We Need to Talk here with us today. It's exciting to have them present what they've learned about health, because it's really not that complicated. I love that title. Uh, from all of the science experts that they've spoken with for over the um, span that they have done this Food We Need to Talk podcast. So hi to all of you. And I'm gonna turn things over to Amy real quick. She's gonna do some announcements for us. Real quick. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, we are really excited about sharing uh, this podcast, this workshop with you today about this podcast and all the other great things that they're gonna tell you about. But first, um, you know, this is technology. So we understand we might have issues and you might have issues. So we have found that one of the best things to do is just to refresh your screen and join us again. Um, of course, we have also found that the Chrome browser does work best for us. So if you have issue in one browser, you can always try another one. And I see many people have already found the chat section. They're joining us from Tyler, Texas, Utah, Oklahoma, Washington State, from all over. And that's one thing that we absolutely love. So find the chat, say hello, tell us where you're uh, joining us from. What's great is we're all in four different places as well. So, um, you know, technology issues happening for us. Give us a second. We'll refresh and come back and join you, too. So uh, we really hope that you enjoy it today. And um, thanks for joining. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Be sure that you are hanging out in the chat because apparently this is going to be pretty interactive today. I'm so excited about it. So let me introduce you to our presenters today. We have Yuna Jata. She graduated from Harvard in 2017 with a degree in cognitive neuroscience and evolutionary physiology. She is the creator and co-host of the podcast, Food We Need to Talk. And along with her co-host, Dr. Eddie Phillips, co-authored a book of the same title. Jata also is also an accomplished concert pianist, having performed at Carnegie Hall and the Kennedy Center. Uh, Yuna is currently obsessed with snowboarding and the gym. That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, Dr. Eddie Phillips is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and the founder and director of the Institute of Lifestyle Medicine at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston. His lifestyle medicine conferences have trained thousands of clinicians on how to use lifestyle factors to prevent chronic disease. When he's not podcasting, writing books, or practicing medicine, he enjoys swimming, biking, running, and lifting light weights. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to both of you, and we're just going to turn the time over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you all of you for having us today. We're so excited because we've heard so much about the Full Plate Living community, so we're really excited to be here. Um, as Michelle said, the title of our talk is Health, It's Not That Complicated. Um, I think, you know, health can seem really complicated, so that's why I wanted to make it not so complicated because it actually isn't. And we first wanted to start off by just introducing ourselves. So um, as Michelle said, my name is Yuna, uh, but relevant to what we're talking about today, I grew up with two very skinny sisters and I was never as skinny as they were. So I spent all of high school and college basically wanting to like lose 10 or 15 pounds to be quote skinny. And so this led to a lot of um, searching online on Instagram, YouTube, and Google for what to do to lose weight. And so I spent a lot of high school and college basically just not eating enough and thinking I had to eat low fat or do juice cleanses or ordering special teas online, so on and so forth, and doing fad exercise programs. As you can imagine, it did not work. Um, so senior year of college, I got really interested in lifting actually. And that is what kind of introduced me to the science-based kind of um, nutrition and exercise community. And when I started to read the literature on exercise and nutrition, it became clear that like the stuff is really not that contentious as it's made to seem online. And it's also not that uh, not understood as a lot of people will have you believe. And so I thought to myself, oh my gosh, how is this so not public information like why are we all still confused and doing things that we know don't work when there is actually science between the stuff that does work so i contacted the health editor at boston's npr station and basically said can i come in and talk to you about your job and she said wow you seem really passionate about this do you want to write a blog for us and i said girl i don't even know what a blog is i want to do a podcast um and she is the one that actually introduced me to eddie so 
me and Eddie started the podcast in 2019. Um, now we've had over 3 million downloads and 50 episodes. We like to say it's a science-based, humor-laced approach to health and fitness because occasionally we like to think we're funny. At least we make each other laugh. Um, and the podcast has, you know, an expert from different fields that we are talking to in each episode. Sometimes it's multiple experts. And then it's basically me and Eddie talking around the expert, joking around, asking them questions. That is what the podcast is all about. And now I'm going to turn it over to Eddie to give his side of the story of how he got introduced and how he <laughs> my, my side of the story. Thank you, Yuna. <laughs> um, so um, um, I'm Eddie Phillips. I'm a physician specializing in physical medicine and rehab. So we're the doctors of the body. Uh, and I've long been uh, for like more than a 30 year career fascinated with our physicality, our ability to exercise, our ability to walk on two feet and to do all sorts of myriad wonderful movements. So I was always fascinated with exercise and wrestled early on with exercise is great, but why don't it, why doesn't everyone do it? And that kind of like, how do you motivate people to do what we know is so critical um, is the beginnings of my entry into the field of lifestyle medicine. So I spent uh, 30 plus years talking to patients and then got a little bit antsy saying, it's great to talk to patients one at a time. Wouldn't it be great to get on stage? So I speak to professional audiences through the Institute of Lifestyle Medicine and then had the opportunity way back in 2016 to launch a uh, sort of a prequel to food we need to talk so we had a podcast this was myself and carrie goldberg who, who is the health who was the health editor at um, wbur so we launched a podcast back in 2016 called the magic pill and guess what that is that was all about exercise we won an edward r murrow award which is like an emmy and it was it sort of wet my appetite and then so she, she was the one that put yuna and i together and I was uh, drawn immediately into Yuna's uh, wonderful sphere of, of humor and, and, and deep intellect and like unending curiosity. Um, and we kind of hit it off. So we uh, put together uh, the podcast, which of course you're welcome to listen to. Um, and then that led with the success of the podcast to, um, as they say in the business, a book deal. Um, and that's the, the, the cover is up there um, on the screen. But let's, I'm going to also um, uh, invite you guys to ask questions as you go. Uh, I'll do my best to interpret them to Yuna, um, you know, if she's speaking or try to answer them as I'm speaking. So pop them in there um, as you go. And I'll ask you guys a few questions along the way so we can have some fun. Um, just a roadmap for what we'll cover in the time that we have together. Um, real simple, uh, we'll talk about calories in. That's the fun part, that's the eating the calories out. Um, we're gonna touch on sleep and stress. Um, and we're going to um, obviously take your questions at the end and in the beginning. And I appreciate uh, Annie's comment that uh, you know, uh, Annie is calling our podcast digestible. <laughs> Clever, huh? <laughs> Um, <laughs> so thank you. So that's kind of like the overview and let's jump right in. I'm going to kind of start with the first one. Um, and this is, um, what I think many people come to when they think about health, they look in the mirror and they say, Ooh, I, you know, wish I were often a couple of pounds lighter than I am, or maybe a lot lighter than I am and kind of get into a uh a culture and an industry i think the last i read was a plus 70 billion dollar a year diet industry in the united states which largely is ineffective and in fact we will argue is uh, dangerous for many people so just to sort of touch base as an entry into this conversation um in the short term all diets are going to work and it's pretty straightforward. There is a, um, not all calories are the same, but if you bring in less calories than you're burning, then the energy has got to come from someplace. That's the law of thermodynamics. And that's going to, that energy is going to come from the stored energy in the fat that we all have in our bodies, even if you're, you're slim. And uh, you're going to, over time, um, lose some weight. And that could be great for folks um, to get there. 
you're going to have to, from what you're doing now, change something. You can either, you, you can choose to restrict the time that you eat, and we can answer questions about time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting, et cetera. You uh, would otherwise need to restrict how much you're eating or what you're eating. So that would be the last one, a food group restriction. And different strategies work for different people. In um, the world of, for, for many people, intermittent fasting is a really positive thing because they could just say, I'm only gonna eat X number of hours per day, whether it's 12 or eight, or um, for some of us, <laughs> 16 hours a day would, would be a restriction uh, if you're choosing not to eat overnight like you used to. Um, but um, uh, you then get to eat sort of, you know, whatever you want within that, shortened period of time so you don't have to count calories um sounds great you know most people can lose some weight in the short term but in the long term nearly all diets fail um uh generously um only 20 percent of diets are going to are going to help and long term the the ability to keep off weight is probably way less than 20 percent um many people see the quote diet not uh, the diet that they're on as temporary. They're at 200 pounds, they diet down to 180 and they figure I'm done. And guess what? If you start eating like a 200 pound person, you're gonna again become a 200 pound person. Um, Long-term behavior change is hard. Um, and if there's one thing that you remember from this entire talk, it's that rather than talking about all of these little details, maybe the most important question is why um, are you looking to lose weight? You know, what is your mission, your aspiration and purpose in life? Is losing the weight or, or changing your diet going to get you closer? Or might you be happier focusing on something else in, in your health? And that's why we're gonna extend this conversation to include sleep and stress and, and of course, exercise. Um, also recognize uh, you guys are writing in from all of the United States and beyond. We live universally in an obesogenic environment. That's fancy talk for um, the, the world is making us fat. There's too many delicious, easily obtainable, cheap calories out there. Um, and then even if you were to be sex successful at losing weight, your body resists that. And that's the whole idea of metabolic adaptation. You know, you want to pick it up from yeah, there? Yeah, so when we looked at participants of The Biggest Loser, which I'm sure you got, a lot of you guys are familiar with, it's the contest where, contest, contest, where everybody goes and tries to lose as much weight as possible. What we see is that even after the competition, first of all, the majority of them gain back the weight and more. But even more importantly, after they've gained back the weight, their metabolism is a lot slower than before the competition, which means that they are put in a much worse position in terms of future weight gain. So we know that the body will adapt its metabolism to basically severe forms of starvation, aka severe dieting and severe over-exercising, which is why we know that really restrictive diets in the long term do kind of make it a lot more difficult to maintain that weight loss and then also make you more likely to gain the weight back. And now we can go to the next slide to talk about what to eat. So as Eddie talked about, diets really manipulate food quantity. And you can kind of do that in any way you want. The quality of the food doesn't really matter. If the quantity is being manipulated, you will lose weight. However, when we talk about what to eat, food quality is really important. So there's a very famous study where a professor at the University of Kansas lost, I think, 30 pounds, and he just ate Twinkies and like, I think he said Doritos or something for variety, but it was basically Twinkies and Doritos every day, and he was still able to lose 30 pounds, and that's because he was just eating little enough of the Twinkies and Doritos that he was still burning more calories than he was eating. So I'm sure a lot of people hearing that are like, oh my God, great, I'm just gonna eat Twinkies and I'll just eat only two a day and I'll be able to lose weight and I'll be so happy. The problem is in the long term, that's really not gonna work because of the problems with ultra processed foods. So when we talk about food quality, ultra processed versus unprocessed is the most important thing to remember. And when you want to think what is ultra processed food, I think we all basically know, I don't think we really need to look at a um, you know really extensive definition, but it's basically junk food to use vernacular for it. So things like brownies, cereals, breads, pastas, et cetera, 
Um, just because it says low fat brownie, high protein brownie, gluten free brownie, it doesn't really matter um, if it didn't basically grow from the ground or come from an animal, it is a form of processed food and sometimes ultra processed foods. So what is the problem with ultra processed foods when we look at the scientific literature? First of all, they're very calorically dense. So that means per volume, they have a lot more calories than unprocessed food. Um, that should be pretty easy to understand because two Oreos is 200 calories and like an entire head of broccoli is 200 calories. So that's pretty intuitive. They're also very tasty. So when we look at rat studies where you give the rats cheesecake, they basically become addicted to the cheesecake. And when you take the cheesecake away and give them back their regular rat food, they will starve instead of eat the regular rat food because that is how used their brain is to the cheesecake. And they are nutrient poor. So that means they don't have a lot of micronutrients. So even though they are giving us the calories we need, like you can calorically survive on Twinkies, Twinkies don't have vitamins and minerals, et cetera, for you to actually be able to have your cells thrive, have your hair grow, um, have your body regenerate, heal wounds, support your immune system, et cetera. Um, they've also been made to be overeaten. So there are entire scientific teams that are dedicated to getting you to eat the most of the processed food as possible. So that's everything from the mouthfeel of the food, like how crunchy it is, the color it is, the taste of it, how much salt, how much sugar, how much fat. They will literally do trials where they'll say, okay, let's have one teaspoon of salt in this bag. Let's put one and a half in this bag. How many of each bag do the people eat? Okay, we're gonna choose the one where they eat the most. And even beyond that, they will even manipulate packaging and the font on packages so that the food will be overeaten and bought the most possible. So now we can go to the next slide and we're gonna be talking about real food now. So real food grows, like I said, from plants or fungi, et cetera. Mushrooms are an example of fungi um, or comes from animals. It is nutrient rich. So it has a lot of vitamins and minerals. Um, it is not tricking your brain to overeat because the human body evolved eating natural food, so it knows how to deal with it. And it has a lot of fiber and water, which means it takes up a lot of space in your stomach. And because of that, it makes you feel more full. So uh, eating more real food improves the quality of your diet, evidently, but it also probably improves the quantity of your diet. So oftentimes, if you start trying to incorporate more real food, you will be more satiated and more full. So you will also eat less processed food. So the question is, what do nutritionists actually agree on in terms of what to eat? Because I think when we look around, it seems like everybody is constantly arguing. Like some people say you should only eat vegetables. Some people say you should only eat meat. And it seems like oh my God, like nobody agrees. We just don't know. There's too many opinions. In reality, that's not actually the case. And the majority of nutritionists will agree on the majority of what to eat. So I'll hand it over to Eddie now for our, what actually we should be eating. So, you know, um, thank you. And I just wanted to point out for people, the slides will be available. Um, Amy and Michelle will make sure of that. And then when you download the slides, um, these are um, live links to the episodes that we're referring to. And if you choose to go to the episode, um, you can, of course, listen to a full discussion with experts on the, these different topics, but then also go to our show notes to get even more information, including links to the scientific articles that underlie, um, undergird what we're talking about. So these are live links with, uh, uh, so thank you for, Yuna, putting that together. Um, so moving on, I'm going to give attribution here first. Uh, this is from... Uh, Stanford and specifically from uh, Professor Christopher Gardner, who was a wonderful guest on our um, podcast. And he put together this graphic, which I will uh, walk you through. Um, he sort of builds this and says, you know, if you look at, you know, all of the myriad diets out there, I think, and hopefully you can see my, my cursor moving around here, that we're pretty much all going to agree that we should be eating more vegetables. Um, and we're pretty much like almost universally going to agree that we do better with whole foods. So less refined uh, flour, if you're doing it, that you wanna have um, you know, whole, whole grains if you're eating grains. Um, and we're also gonna agree as we focus on here that universally gonna agree that less added sugars, we could argue about whether some people are gonna say no added sugars, okay? But uh, even the people that say no added sugars are still <laughs> saying, saying less um, than, than you're eating now. And 
Americans eat something crazy like 100 pounds of refined sugars per year, um, we have a lot of room to cut back. And, and even uh, as Yuna was talking about ultra processed foods, which are hyper palatable, um, they account fright frighteningly for more than half, specifically 53% of the calories that are consumed um, in, across um, the United States each year. So we have a long ways to improve and just having less added sugars, less processed foods, ultra processed foods, less refined grains is gonna be a universal um, recommendation. As you move into the circle around there, um, pretty universal is going to be a recommendation that we could really do well with eating more beans. Uh, all sorts of legumes, a uh, good way to experiment, um, you get your body used to them. There's uh, ways of, of accommodating um, to, to beans. Um, some fruits, vegetables are kind of more primary, but we can, we can, always, we can eat more fruits. Uh, the average number of servings of fruits and vegetables, the recommendation is five. But it's again rather low, you know, somewhere between one and two servings per day per American on average. So we're going to advocate for more fruit. Um, a handful of nuts um, is is of uh, universal re recommendation. And then um, you know we start getting into um, uh, someone who's vegan or vegetarian may not want to eat eggs or fish, but we're we're going to put that on here as a recommendation especially if it's replacing something like red meat um, and or especially like a processed meat. Whenever there's a question about, <laughs> one of my favorite questions that we'll get and we're not the only ones is, so should I have an egg for breakfast? And, I, you know, not, not to um, give people a hard time, but I'll answer that question with, a, with another question, like instead of what? If you're trading in a Krispy Kreme donut for an egg, eat the egg. If you're happily eating avocado toast and, and, a, and a vegetable smoothie, you know, maybe going towards an egg is not the best thing. Um, you know, what else is the egg with? Is it, you know, the, the little bit of protein on your plate or is it in the middle of um, uh, whatever, you know, the super trucker breakfast is at, at, a, at a fast food uh, restaurant with lots of processed meats around it. So what is it with, but what is it instead of? As we're talking about kind of these recommendations, I'm going to give a, a little a question to the audience. This one's fun, um, which is that even as you make these recommendations, and I'm a clinician, so I'm knee to knee with my patients negotiating these things. I have a colleague, Tom Rafai, he's uh, practicing in uh, Detroit. And when he talks to his patients, he begins with a question of what it, are your non negotiable foods? You know, so I'm going to invite people here. Uh, and I'll ask you next, and I'll re reveal one of mine, that no matter what the science uh, shows, and no matter what we say, no matter how compelling the evidence is, what kind of food are you most likely not giving up? And we already hear people writing in, they're going to not give up their butter and their popcorn and their cheese and their cookies and their cucumbers and their pizza and their beer and their chocolate and their chocolate and their chocolate <laughs> and their bread. And you're getting the idea there. For me, um, it's it's coffee ice cream, um, beer on a hot day, bread, wine and wine and chocolate. If this is feeding your soul, feed your soul. Um, and uh, you know you'll be very happy to know that chocolate is, I think, winning the day here. Yes. Um, so just a la last couple are um, that are of universal interest is poultry and whole grains. Again, you know what are you replacing it with? But definitely we want to have whole grains. You know, you want to yeah, take I was over gonna say, I always, also tell us you're not. Yeah, I, I always answer dark chocolate to this, but I feel like that's kind of a cop out because some people still think dark chocolate is healthy, even if it has a little bit of sugar. But I think a better answer would actually be the holiday drinks at Starbucks. Like those are probably the worst you can get because they are a sugar sweetened beverage technically, even though they're not, um, you know, Coca-Cola or Pepsi. But like if it's pumpkin, pumpkin spice comes out tomorrow, guys, alert. It is pumpkin spice season officially tomorrow. So I will be getting one. Um, it doesn't matter what anybody says. It could, they could tell me it'll kill me the next day and I will still be getting it tomorrow. Um, we can move on to the next slide. And now we're gonna be talking about the metabolism. So when I was growing up, I thought that metabolism was like this magical thing because 
my parents used to always say the reason my sisters were skinnier than I was was because they had a faster metabolism. So I was just like, oh man, I guess some people just get super lucky and I'm not lucky and that's how it works. Um, so it turns out actually we have a pretty good understanding of metabolism and it basically has these four components. So the biggest component is the basal metabolic rate. And I should say the scientific word for metabolism in the literature is total daily energy expenditure. Um, I don't know why they have to make things so complicated because I, I think that makes it sound a lot more annoying, but nevertheless, here we are. So the basal metabolic rate is going to be the majority of your metabolism. And it's basically the energy your body burns just to keep itself alive. So whether or not you are aware of it, your body is constantly using energy for a lot of biological processes. So obviously your brain has to be running at all times. Your heart is pumping, your lungs are breathing, your hair is growing, your nails are growing, cells are turning over. All of these things are constantly happening and all of the calories used to have those things happen is your basal metabolic rate. So the majority of the calories you burn in a day come from the stuff that you don't even know about. And if they were to measure your BMR in a lab, they would have you lie down on a bed and have a mask on your face and you wouldn't be allowed to blink or go to the bathroom or move. You would just lie there. That would be the calories of your BMR if you measured that for 24 hours. The next biggest portion is the non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is going to be the energy that you burn with non-exercise activities. So these are things like I'm moving my hands while I talk or my mouth moving, I'm walking around, I'm standing, I'm grocery shopping. Um, all of those things are going to be your non-exercise activities. Then we have the thermic effect of food. This is the calories you burn digesting the food. So obviously when you put food into your mouth, it goes in one way, it comes out a very different way. What happens in between, that's the digestion process and that process takes a lot of energy because your body needs to extract the calories from the food by breaking the chemical bonds of the food. And the last portion, which is the smallest portion, is exercise activity thermogenesis. So um, heartbreakingly for everyone, exercise is the smallest portion of your metabolism, which is why trying to out-exercise a bad diet is always a losing battle. It is like five to 10% of your metabolism for people who exercise. And the majority of people do not exercise. So for those people, it's 0%. So if you think about it, when you go to the gym, let's say you're there for, I don't know, an hour and a half, how much of that time are you actually exercising? Maybe 45 minutes. Um, and if you average out those three or four gym sessions over the week, it just turns out it's really not that many calories. So what is the biggest determinant of your BMR, you may be wondering, because it's the biggest portion of your metabolism. And that is actually your muscle mass. So individuals who have higher muscle mass are going to have a higher metabolism because their BMR is so much higher. And that is because muscle is a very expensive tissue. So if you look at um, muscle and fat, fat uses a lot less calories than muscle does, which is why muscle is a much more expensive tissue for your body to upkeep. And the biggest reason for variability in the metabolism, so why does one person have a much higher metabolism versus another person, is going to be their non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So when they measured people's metabolisms and they looked at the people that had the highest metabolism, the people that had the lowest, there was genetic variation, but one of the biggest things that caused differences in metabolism is how active people were. So for example, somebody who has a job as a mail carrier is going to burn thousands of calories more than somebody whose job is just to sit at a desk, just by nature of their job. So basically the way your life is laid out is also going to be a huge determinant of your metabolism. I know another massive question that people will have about metabolism is does it slow down as they age? And luckily for us, we had a giant study come out a couple of years ago that looked at people who ranged from a couple weeks old to in their 90s. And basically what they found was your metabolism does not slow down in your 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50s, and then it starts to slow down a little bit in your 60s and beyond. And I know that's going to be shocking to everyone. Everyone's gonna say, that's not true. I know for a fact my metabolism was faster when I was a teenager, when I was in my 20s, so on and so forth. And the reason you may be noticing that is actually because as we age, we lose muscle and we stop moving as much. So starting in your 30s especially, people will lose something like five to 10% of their muscle mass for every decade. And like we said, muscle is your most metabolically active tissue. So that causes a lot of slowdown in your metabolism. And you'll also notice the older you get, a lot of the time people become more inactive. So, you know, when you're younger, you're running around playing. When you're in your 20s, maybe you're going out more, whatever. And then as you get older, you just move around less. So this idea that our metabolism slows down is not because of some biological thing that is happening to us that is required of aging. It's actually because we don't exercise as much and we stop moving as much. So a really good way to ensure that that metabolic slowdown does not happen through middle age is to maintain that muscle mass 
And then once you get into your 60s, there is a little bit of metabolic slowdown, but it's nothing that drastic. So um, I think we can all be actually hopeful in that we do have some control over our metabolism in middle age. And now I'm going to pass it over to Eddie to expand on the muscle. Well, you, you know, I'm, I'm just reading one of the questions. And I'll, I'll get your, your input and then do my best at it. Uh, where does soy, where, where does highly processed soy proteins shaped into meats, of course, fall on the diagram? The, the, the yeah, the so diagram. this is a great question. So if it, think about the soy protein that's made into the shape of a sausage, and then think about where it actually came from, right? It came from soybeans. And if the relationship between the two is almost unrecognizable, like if you showed it to a person 300 years ago and said, hey, can you see these two things are related? The further they look from each other, the more processed it is, right? So um, I, I mean, I love a soy riso, but it is a very, very processed food. The same with protein powder. Like I, that, this also broke my heart when I found out protein powder was super processed, but it makes sense. Protein powder does not look like anything of what it came from. So for athletes, it is important, for example, to have protein shakes because they cannot get enough protein from unprocessed sources, but it is a highly processed form of food, if that makes sense. So maybe something like edamame would be a good choice of getting protein from soy, but in a less processed way. But so it, would it fall under the ultra processed? It's not engineered for palatability. Yeah. Or maybe it is. I mean, you, it is. you, you want to have that in soy the official sausage. qualifications. All of the um, like soy meats or beyond meats are all in the ultra process, even if they're not made like some ultra processed food is engineered to taste really good. But basically it has to do with how much processing goes into it. And it was in the ultra processed category. So I, and I think what this speaks to um, and this is something that you and I just you know talk about endlessly off out of the studio and, and 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 sometimes on the podcast is just that you know we like to adopt certain rules around our, our eating and then um we, we could fit things around it so if uh, i think john wrote in uh he's not going to eat something if it has a face mother or eyebrows um and uh, you know this is um I, you know i've heard this uh before and that's that's fine and if you want to have something that tastes like sausage then the highly processed soy proteins shaped as as meat may be very uh, uh, palatable. I mean, it like maybe something that you really want to have because you still want to vary, you know, what what you're eating. Um, the uh, you know one of the things that I think gets a lot of my patients and and you know, we we certainly hear this or we we know this for ourselves is that the rigidity of the rules sometimes gets us into into a bad way. So. Um, there was also a comment here, you know, you can respond to this and, you know, I've learned that even a single egg can be detrimental to your health, raising your LDL and, and the references to nutrition facts and, and Michael Greger who runs that does like phenomenal work. But again, um, yes, it can be de detrimental to your health compared to what though? Again, if you're eating an egg instead of a, 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 a Krispy Kreme donut, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think you're still doing better. You know, yeah, thoughts no, on that agree. before we go on? Um, and we'll move on to, I have to find the next slide. There it is. Uh, keep going, you know, metabolism. Um, so I, I think we're going to talk about muscle mass, basically. So um, one of the ways that we can support a healthy metabolism, like I mentioned, is going to be muscle mass. And you may be asking yourself, how do we maintain our muscle mass as we age? And that is where Eddie's going to take over because this is actually his specialty is resistance training and exercise. Oh, I got an easy question to answer for Sandy. Yuna, what's the name of the podcast again? <laughs> the podcast is called Food We Need to Talk. And it's also the name of the book, but yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, I'm sorry. And, 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 and Amy, Amy has already answered Amazing. that. Amazing. So. Um, um, and then an another question is uh, about the Nova classification. Yeah, that's the, that's the classifications we were talking about. So those are the official classifications for ultra processed, processed and minimally processed. Um, and, and people of course challenge that, but it, it's, it's a good proxy to start with. Right. I think Michael um, Collin also has really good guidelines for this that don't go based on the Nova classification. But if you look up like his rules for what is processed food or what are food like substances, that should give you a great um, idea. And then uh, I'm just going to keep on taking them as, as we, as we go. There's a question from Joanne, would grass fed beef 
be a good choice for occasional meals. Yeah, I do. And I'm going to start off saying compared to what? <laughs> if 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 it's compared to uh, a, a a cattle from a from a factory, you're probably better. Um, if you look into red meat production, even ones that are in factory that are given some grass at their end of their, their life but are not actually grazed are sometimes called grass fed. So be careful there whether it's actually sort of free range or not. If your concern is about planetary health and the amount of methane released and the amount of water used and uh, the impact on um, the, the climate emergency, red meat universally, uh, even if it is grazed um, uh, cattle, has an outsized impact compared to something like chicken. So yeah, you know, like again, um, you know, it's probably better in some cases. Um, thoughts on that? Before yeah, we go I think on? Um, compared to a lot of other meats, like processed meats, um, it's going to be a much better choice. Like Eddie said, though, if you care about the planet, I feel like I was so selfish for the longest time. I didn't care about the planet. And now that I'm seeing all like the crazy stuff happening, like, oh, this is why we all need to care. This is crazy now. So uh, if you do care about the planet, then yeah, other forms of meat can be more environmentally friendly. And and there and and this has been well described in um, a in the Lancet, the the medical journal from um, London. Um, there's a a, pro, a thing called Eat E A T Lancet, and it was all laid out. And the top two on the list in terms of impact on greenhouse gases are lamb and beef. And then you start working your way down. And uh, when you get obviously down to like a carrot, there's not that much of of a, a negative impact. And chicken is, is for instance, way down. Um, the chart there. So again, you, you have to eat something. It's a matter of choosing, um, and uh, we're always making those decisions. Um, but on to metabolism, because we could talk about calories out and keep the talk moving. And this is the subject of pretty much my specialty. I mentioned that the podcast that we did was called The Magic Pill, because that's what um, exercise um, is. And thank you for putting in the Eat Lancet uh, link over there, Michelle. Um, within the world of exercise, um, you and I can uh, talk uh, about different ends of the resistance exercise. Uh, resistance um, exercise is the, the kind of a medical or scientific term for weightlifting or using bands or using your body weight. Anything that stresses your muscles is going to make them um, develop more. Um, and it, you know, when you're actually lifting the weights, you're not burning a lot of calories, but you're building up muscle and muscle is sort of, uh, I think, you know, sort of like more expensive, uh, sort of higher maintenance. Uh, you may not want to be like a high maintenance individual, but you kind of want to have high maintenance <laughs> um, uh, muscles on your body. It's going to support a healthier metabolism. As we get older, um, and I'm beyond the part of the, the study that Una presented in terms of metabolism slowing, we naturally lose muscle mass, but we could forestall it, slow it, possibly reverse it with sufficient resistance training. At any age, 60, 70, 80, 90, there were 100 year olds put into studies, lifting weights and putting on muscle mass and getting more functional. So we never lose that ability, but do not wait until you're 80, 90 and 100. Um, it's also crucial for weight loss maintenance. So it turns out we've mentioned the uh, uh, National Weight, Con weight, weight Control uh, Registry. People um, that uh, and, and other people who've successfully lost weight and want to kind of go back towards what they were eating before the diet, they could make up uh, you know 150 calories or plus per day by having hungry or trained muscles on board. So not only do you want to have more muscles, you want them to be trained because then they're even hungrier for calories. Uh, cardio, um, uh, running, walking, swimming, uh, uh, yeah, I guess even playing paddleball these days, uh, burns more calories in the short term. Um, it's obviously good for your heart health. Um, it, that along with resistance training is going to um, promote uh, longevity. It's going to promote not just living longer, but having a longer health span, being more functional longer uh, and later into life. Um, lots of people love to call up and say, yeah, well, I love to lift weights. Isn't that more important? Or I love to run marathons. Isn't that more important? They're both good. They're both complementary. Yuna, 
what do you think? Yeah, um, I'd say me and Eddie both come at this from different kind of, like Eddie's I think natural inclination is more towards cardio and mine was definitely more towards lifting weights because I think I always saw cardio as a punishment for eating food. I was like, oh, I have to run 300 calories on the treadmill because I ate a 300 calorie whatever. Um, but I think the message of doing both is most important. So if you can find a way to do cardio that you love, it doesn't really matter what it is as long as you have fun doing it. And then I also love Professor Andy Galpin's recommendations for cardio, which is basically do one time a week of longer, lower intensity cardio. So this could be like just a brisk walk for like an hour or a hike, for example. And then one time a week of a medium, moderate length. So this could be like a jog for 30 minutes. And then one time a week, try to get your heart rate close to its max. So this is like a higher intensity, really, really short thing. So like just doing intervals on the bike or just doing sprints. And that to me made it a lot more manageable because otherwise I'm like, I, I can't do running every day. It would drive me insane. So <laughs> I think those recommendations made it a lot easier for me. So, uh, so a couple of things, um, you know, I, I have a proposal for food. We need to talk bumper stickers and we have a few nominations uh -huh. uh, for what's on the bumper sticker. One of them is from uh, Stacia motion is lotion. Oh. And then, and then er earlier in the conversation, I can't find the name. Sorry. was, uh, to, uh, uh, rest is rust. <laughs> totally. So, so thank you guys for, for putting that in. There's a quick question from Marciella about, are there exercises that can be both resistance and cardio? Yeah. Marcel, Marcella wants to be the most efficient. <laughs> so actually, when you look at like what is happening physiologically, most exercises are kind of going to be both. So everything is cross training to a certain extent, right? Because if you're running, it does require your muscles to run. And if you're lifting, your heart rate does come up when you're lifting. So almost all forms of exercise are somewhat both. Um, it's more about the message each sends to your body. So when you run a lot, the message for your body is to adapt in the sense of getting better at cardiovascular activity. So that's going to be like your heart is adapting and your muscles aren't necessarily getting the signal to grow that much. It's more like your body's becoming better at running. And if you lift heavy, your body gets a signal to grow those muscles and it's not really a signal to become better cardiovascularly. So I wouldn't think of it so much as like, is there exercise that do both? Cause they will all do both, but more as like, you want to be giving your body both of those messages. Like I need you to be stronger and I also need you to be more cardiovascularly fit. Moving along, um, met more on metabolism. Yeah, so the other ways that we have of promoting a healthy metabolism besides muscle mass are going to be avoiding crash dieting. So if you are uh, like myself, that part may be in the past for you. Maybe you've already crash dieted. But if you haven't yet, then it's a good thing to know um, ahead of time that if you are going to be crash dieting a lot, it will probably lower your metabolism in the long run. So feeding your body enough and actually um, not over exercising, so not running like 20 miles a day is going to actually help your body to have a higher metabolism. Uh, the other thing is incorporating movement. So we've also talked about this a lot. Um, people having different jobs really impact their daily movement. So if you have a sitting job like me and Eddie both do, then you can just incorporate more movement into your day. So Eddie is excellent about when we are recording the podcast. He is always standing. I'm always lazy and I sit for a while. He had convinced me to actually uh, stand. And then I was like, Eddie, like this is like so annoying for, <laughs> for me reading my scripts. <laughs> so then I started sitting down. But Eddie is really, really good about having a bike desk he also takes meetings walking i take meetings all the time walking i know it's kind of annoying for the other person on the line but your health is more important in my opinion um, and a healthy metabolism means that you will have more food flexibility which in today's obesogenic environment is really really helpful because we want to be able to eat a lot because there's a lot of food around so that is why we want to promote a healthy metabolism eddie i don't know if you have anything to add to that or if you want to go to the next slide so um i just um uh, I'm, 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 look, I'm reading some of the questions. Sorry. The um, one of the things is just that the the standing um, can just be intermittent. Even breaking up the um, your your day and not sitting for hours on end can be really helpful. So one of the institutional things that are is going on where I work at at my the local VA Veterans Health Administration in Boston is that we have managed to convince the, man the management to when you schedule meetings, so these are the endless meetings that go on all day, the default is now not 60 minutes in the hour. 
So just like we know from psychologists and psychiatrists, not all hours have 60 minutes in them. When I schedule a meeting, it now has 50 minutes in it. And what that gives me a chance to do is to go and uh, refill my, my water bottle, to go to, to pee because I've just drank a water bottle in the last hour, um, to maybe get a breath of air, uh, maybe do a, a couple of squats in the office and at least not sit endlessly. So the idea is not that you have to stand all day. If you do that, you'll be coming to me as a rehab physician because your back hurt and your legs hurt and whatnot, but but just to break it up periodically, just have sort of like, like think high school, like passing time, you got to walk five minutes to the next class. And just to add, um, even and that just to add on to that, Eddie, when they did studies on indigenous tribes that still live in hunter-gatherer societies, they thought they would find that they sat a lot less than we do, but they actually sat on average about the same amount of time total in the day. But the difference was they were getting up all the time in the middle of that sitting. So they would get up like every 20 minutes to do something, to stretch, to whatever, whereas we would like sit for hours. So even just getting up, standing up and sitting back down will already send signals to your muscles to basically keep them active. Um, and also trying not to like sit back and slouch in your chair like this, like trying to have an active posture is also going to make a big difference in how your body responds to sitting for a long time. I love this question from Oded. Does brain exercise improve your metabolism? <laughs> Um, <laughs> the crossword puzzle is right. <laughs> no i actually do know when they've measured that people are like working on essays and stuff they actually their brain does increase its caloric use but it's like it's not a crazy amount of it's like actually a really little amount but you'll notice how a lot of people report like they get so much hungrier when they're doing a lot of work um and it's because like their brain is actually using more energy unfortunately the brain is small enough that it's not it's not a huge measurable difference um, but I like the crossword puzzle. Diet yeah, anyway. same. So, um, so um, one of the things you know that, that that I've learned in talking to lots of patients and doing the podcast and writing the book with you now is that people often enter this world um, in, you know, through the, the the guise of like you know what should I eat, how much should I eat, when should I eat it, all the things that we talked about um, with the goal of trying to lose weight and um, and as I mentioned earlier knowing why um, you're wanting to do it is critical but then also taking stock of what you, you know what you're already good at perhaps or where there may be other deficits may be a better place to start so for those people that are frustrated with i can't change my diet i can't lose weight i'm still diabetic etc um sometimes it helps to actually do like a really simple uh 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 question of like, all right, so where are you with your sleep? Where are you with your stress? Because for so many people, um, being stressed is actually the sort of the nidus, the, the, the inception of, uh, poor, you know, less than optimal health and same with not getting enough sleep. So once again, so I always ask people and for many folks, this is, I mean, if you're a new parent or you just have a new puppy or you're trying to get through, uh, an internship in, in the hospital, working 80 hours a week, uh, you know, talking about what to eat is probably not the best place to start. How are we going to maximize your sleep? Um, because getting enough sleep and managing your stress directly affect your eating. If you want to do this horrific experiment that I do, um, you know, with some frequency now, after a poor night's sleep, it's really hard to um, eat healthy food. Your, your metabolism or your, the, your hormones change from your short sleep. So getting enough sleep can help um, uh, wanting to move and having a quality of movement and, and having the energy to get out and move will change if you're feeling stressed, et cetera. Overall quality of life, um, your brain functioning, I think we all experience that. If you're overly stressed by anything, whether it's financial or it's a test or um, you happen to have a teenager or a toddler at home, um, that can um, affect your your brain functioning. Um, you know, comments on that? Yeah, um, was, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, about I was stress? gonna say one of my favorite. Um, I mean, this isn't like favorite in a good way, but one of my favorite things to say about sleep that I think gets people's attention is that getting four hours of sleep or less makes a healthy individual pre-diabetic the next day. 
So that's how much it impairs your blood sugar regulation is like you don't have diabetes, you are pre-diabetic the next day just by sleeping less. So um, there's a reason why we've evolved to spend a third of our lives sleeping, which is like the most vulnerable state you could be in. You're not hunting, you're not reproducing, you're not able to protect yourself. It is an extremely vulnerable position to be put in. And the human body has evolved to spend a third of a life doing that. So that's how important it is. Um, if we go on to the next slide, we can talk about a few. Okay. And, 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 you know, we, we're, we're, we're big fans of, of um, dad jokes and puns. So I wanted to share John's that, quote, stress can often feed mindless eating. Yes. Pun intended. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, John. Uh, move, moving on. Eddie can add that to his toolkit to of dad jokes to, to use on the podcast because <laughs> he loves them. Um, so some habits to promote good sleep. Um, I want to preface this with saying that I know a lot of us like know these habits and then don't actually do them. So I'm going to I'm going to just say that, like, look at these habits with a fresh eye and a fresh mind to think about, like, how you can actually implement some of these things to improve your sleep. So first of all, not having an alarm in the day. I know this isn't on the slide, but just think about having an alarm at night to tell yourself to start getting ready for bed. Bed shouldn't be like, oh yeah, I get ready for bed at 10, I'm in bed at 10.05. First of all, that's probably never gonna happen. But second of all, you're probably also not gonna get a really good night's sleep that way because your body actually needs time to wind down. So how can you wind down before bed? We can reduce the lights in our house. So if you want, I have very fancy red lights in my house where they only emit red light. So literally like my house looks red after 8 p.m. I've gotten my roommates to agree to this, which was a great accomplishment for me. And everybody loves it because you can just feel your whole body calm down without the blue light. It's insane. You can order them on Amazon. Um, they're like my favorite thing. Anyways, besides that, reducing your phone light. If you don't have special red lights, you can just dim the lights in your house or maybe light candles to kind of get that kind of like sleepy time ambiance. Not eating or exercising super close to bed. So eating and exercising within the hour before bed actually also has been shown to disrupt sleep. Um, cooling down your room to a slightly cooler than comfortable temperature for a lot of people. So around 68 is what most people's uh, best temperature for sleeping is. And then also giving yourself the permission to wind down. So not working right up until bed, not hanging out with people right up until bed, not like getting into an argument right before bed. All of these things do impact sleep. And then something that's also not on here is substances. So alcohol does disrupt sleep, even if you think it makes you fall asleep faster. That is because it's a sedative but when we look at sleep quality, it really impairs your REM sleep and your deep sleep, which are the two most important parts of your sleep quality. So subjectively, you think you sleep better, but when we measure it in the lab, you actually sleep worse drinking any amount of alcohol before bed. Also coffee, so having coffee in the afternoon still impacts sleep quality. Even if you think you're falling asleep, it will decrease the amount of deep sleep. Sleeping pills also decrease sleep quality. So looking into all these things and trying to get better sleep in the most natural way possible is going to help you actually improve your sleep quality. And then we have things to reduce your stress. So uh, deep breathing and mindfulness and meditation. I think these things are kind of self-evident. There's a lot of apps that can help you do this nowadays. Um, something that goes along with the deep breathing is also nasal breathing is going to help you tapping, tap into that vagus nerve and the uh, parasympathetic nervous system to calm down. Exercise is a great stress reduction. So in the short term, exercise is a stressor on the body, but in the long term, it helps you reduce stress. And then being outside in nature and with friends and family are two things that I think are really neglected. So I live in a city, it's like there's not much nature around, but I try to make sure every day or every other day that I walk to the river around sunset and basically hang out with the trees, the river and the sunset. It makes me feel nice and I do think it vastly improves my quality of life. And then of course, family and friends should be self-evident. Our family and friends are a really, really important part of our health that I think a lot of us don't consider a part of our health. But when we look at the most important things for people that have the happiest lives and live the longest, they all have really, really strong social communities around them. So uh, I just put a question in for um, for folks to share their favorite way of managing their stress. Uh, we Properly, we shouldn't even talk about reducing stress because unless you get rid of the teenagers in your house you can't really you know reduce the stress right um they do leave they, they do grow up eventually but the um but you know what are you doing to manage your stress and people are uh, saying everything from music and dancing to a good bike ride amen that that was mine uh reading reading my mule riding my mules wow okay. elaine send the pictures walking cuddling with a dog yeah. taking a walk reading the bible and devotionals exercise hobbies reading again 
um, more, more dancing, a good cry movie and belly laughing with my favorite people, music, listening to podcasts. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yoga, you get the idea that um, people have many different ways of, um, uh, and you know, if, if it, you don't have something, look at this list and try something. So amen, thank you. And I think we're gonna kind of wrap up and take questions that we've missed. Um, the book um, you're invited to to buy, to ask at the library, to download. Uh, Yuna and I have an Audible version, which is a lot of fun. Um, we are most appreciative um, uh, for uh, Full Plate Living having Yuna and I on. Uh, this has been the most wonderful yes. partnership, I think, what Full Plate Living espouses and actually makes doable is, is in perfect concert with everything that we talk about. So we're honored to uh, to be here to share um, and, uh, share with you to answer. And uh, man, you speak our language. <laughs> and, I and, um, <laughs> First thing I'm going like. to do is I'm going to share the slides. We had a lot of people <laughs> ask about the slides. So I'm going to share those. They'll be under the handout so you can click and download those. Um, as I mentioned also in the chat, we will have a recording of this workshop on that recording page. We will also have the slides there available for you. So if you misplace them or whatever, and you still want to go back and reference all those, you absolutely can. I know we did have one question about the slides. Um, someone was wanting to, um, let's see, Sarah said, I'm an MD and doing a full plate living group. Thank you for doing those uh, with patients. Can I use your slides in my presentation? So she's letting know she can use those and share your um, share your information. So I, I think I, I think I tried to answer it. Um, I don't know if it went just to uh, to Sarah, but yet, yes, you're welcome to use the slides, please, with with attribution. Uh, also, note as I when you talk to your audiences that they can look at the slides and then like click through to the episodes and get to the show notes and and find their way, uh, you know, to, to as much information as they want. So yes, we'd love to, and I'd love to hear back how it's being yeah. received because. Um, Absolutely. You and I love chatting with each Absolutely. other. Thank um, you for being willing to do that. We do the same with our slides so. as far as things that are ours. As long as you, you know, give us reference on that, that's great. We we greatly appreciate that sharing too. And thank you, Sarah, for doing a full plate group program. Awesome. Thanks for sharing this. Any any other questions, Amy? That we actually do have just five questions actually you've, we've answered a few of them so maybe just three questions um and if you don't feel comfortable answering any of them just let us know there may be some that we may feel more comfortable answering and that's fine so um here's a question is weight training the best then um so i think the answer to this is that there is no the best you should be doing both um i'd say for people that are specifically interested in weight loss i just err on the side of weight training because I think it's so underappreciated and it is going to be the best way to maintain your muscle mass and maintain your metabolism as you lose weight and try not to regain weight basically. So in that sense for weight loss, I do think weight training is a much better form of exercise than just cardio. But if you're talking about for health overall, I think the answer is always going to be both. And, 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 and one, one helps the other. So as I've shared on the podcast, um, I'm training, with my wife to run a uh, the New York City Marathon in a few months. And yes, you run a lot to prepare to run a marathon, but the secret and what's allowed us to train, this would be our second marathon, largely without injuries, is doing enough resistance training to strengthen up for the demands. So one, one feeds the other. Excellent. Here's another question. What is the impact of perimenopause and menopause on metabolism? So we are going to have an episode coming up on this in mid-October. So I'd say listen to the podcast for that. Um, there are hormonal changes that happen in menopause that do slow down the metabolism and um, kind of promote weight gain in the middle portion of the body, so around the torso. Um, I don't know the specifics of it just yet because we are interviewing the expert on this 
in I think a week or two. So <laughs> I won't know much more then, but tune in in October. There's going to be a whole women's series and we're going to have an episode on periods, one on menopause and one on prenatal nutrition and exercise. So. Wonderful. And we will be sharing those. We share the podcasts in our newsletters. I know we have two. We're, we're a little bit behind you guys, so it gives us time to add them to our newsletter. So we have two episodes upcoming in the next couple of weeks. So be on the lookout for those. All right. So our last question, and this was one person ans uh, an asking the question. However, there were two or three others who said I'm in the same boat or I have the same issue. Uh, my doctor has told me that will, it will be nearly impossible to lose weight because I'm insulin dependent type two diabetic. He says the insulin holds the weight on, not an excuse to eat badly or not exercise, but he's just trying to keep me from being too frustrated. Any suggestions for insulin dependence? So I think this is really a difficult position to be put in. I'd say that the best advice I would have is to take your focus off of the weight. Um, I think a lot of us think that like the best way to better health is to lose weight. But we know that if you improve your eating behaviors and your exercise behaviors, you your weight could not change at all, but your health will improve. So um, regardless of whether or not your weight changes and whether or not insulin impacts that, I would say take the focus off of that and put your focus on something that you do have control over and that will actually change. And if you, for example, start resistance training and your weight stays exactly the same, but you're getting stronger in the gym, what that means is you're replacing some of the fat on your body with muscle. So you will look different regardless of whether or not the scale weight is changing. And muscles are sugar sponges. They literally take the blood sugar from the sugar from your blood and store it within them as glycogen. So it also will really, really help with people who have trouble with insulin to build as much muscle mass as possible because you are literally building sugar sponges into your body. I don't know if any so and just one just one other perspective if you look at I'll, I'll refer people to the american college of lifestyle medicine um which talks about using all of that we've talked about um you know a, a appropriate nutrition and adequate exercise and enough sleep and relationships and you know managing your stress etc as a means to not just prevent chronic illness such as diabetes uh, but actually to treat it and in the best cases to reach, uh, to reverse it. So I think there's a little bit more of an optimistic picture out there about um, dealing with a chronic disease like uh, diabetes um, through sort of the whole lifestyle um, approach uh, with the goal of reversing the illness. You'll, you're still sort of technically diabetic, but if you reduce the need for insulin even a little bit, or switch to an oral uh, medication instead of the insulin, it's it's to your benefit. So I think we're, medicine is evolving uh, a little bit more uh, optimistically towards, um, uh, but I, I'm gonna I appreciate add in something saying, here too. Um, if many of you may not know, we actually are, further, Full Plate um, Living, with, our with programs are um, certified through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, because we do try to teach a lot of, a lot of the aspects that you've taught today, a lot of the different pillars of health, of whole health, and so um, one of the kind of exciting things we've had happen in the last year is even updating our online program. So we do have a weight loss course and a diabetes course, um, which do a lot, you know, deal with kind of the root causes of some of these things. Our new version that is coming out, we will have a lot more built in on these aspects um, of behavior changing, helping change your habits and um, around sleep, around stress, and those type of different things to help you accomplish those. So if you have not already joined Full Plate Living, here is our plug to join Full Plate Living um, to get access to these free programs. And we're 100% free. So, um, you know, this is something you can literally start today um, to ma start making those small habit adoptions, really, that can lead to some great, amazing um, changes around diabetes, weight, general health. Thank you. And I'm going to throw in one other thing that maybe a lot of people don't know about us is that Full Plate Living grew out of a center where diabetics came in and stayed with us. It was a medical center and they would stay with us for two to three weeks. And absolutely, if you can optimize your insulin, 
And so if you can optimize your blood sugar levels, you will have an easier time with weight loss. It doesn't mean that you're going to become a skinny mini. So that's not the goal here. Just like we talked earlier, right? It's about those habits. It's about honing in the best foods for your body so it can handle it. And then you have better blood sugar readings. Yes. Keep and working with your physician. You know, there's, there's um, we are very blessed with well. a good medical, so um, that is modern awesome. day medicine. It's a very wonderful good thing. So it's a matter of, of yeah. really working both of these together. Yes, we are. Yes. All right, we have more questions. Apparently we're very good at answering questions, so we have more. Um, and we are only going to answer three more questions because we are over our time already. So what about for those who are neurodivergent? Um, I have ADHD and my brain will often throw me into a binge eating session. Okay, so binge eating is a really, it's a diag like a clinical diagnosis. So um, Eddie and I are, neither of us are certified to speak on eating disorders, but I can say that you definitely can look into different treatments of binge eating. So mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. is the front line of treatment of binge eating. I have struggled with binge eating, not because I have ADHD, but just when I was dieting a lot, I struggled with it a lot. So for me, a lot of the answer was stopping restriction. But then I also had to like talk to a therapist for a long time about how I was using binge eating basically as a way to cope with emotions. So binge eating can be caused by a lot of different um, things for people and you have to find the right treatments available for you. There are also medications that have been approved for binge eating and there are also alternative forms of treatment that are like pending FDA approval like ketamine treatments and stuff like that. So I would just do more research and also talk to a therapist who is um, specialized for eating disorders because they will be able to help you a lot more specifically with how it interacts with ADHD. So I'll, I'll approach this from the ADHD side, um, which, which is to say that some of the best treatments for uh, ADHD include exercise. Uh, it includes getting enough sleep. Um, it includes um, eating well. Um, the, I probably, we, you know, we talk about people preparing their, their refrigerator, having, you know, like the snacks that are ready to go, like cut up carrots and other fiber rich vegetables um, ready to go if if your type of ADHD allows you to hyper focus which is an element of of, of um, ADHD uh, maybe that's the time to do your cooking and have the food ready um, and and try to avoid uh, you know the, the choice of as much as you can control the foods that are in the house because yes if your brain as you say put throws you into a, um, a, a binge um, and and you've got lots of hyper palatable foods around like yeah you know like i'm not surprised uh and you're probably not surprised if you end up eating them so a lot of preparation um focus a little bit more um you know on including the diet um exercise sleep you know throw in meditation which can also help uh, not an easy issue but you know we can always evolve towards doing a little bit better Excellent. And last question, how does hormonal birth control influence metabolism? So uh, we've also are going to have a whole episode on this. Um, it hasn't come out yet, but there are a lot of changes that happen with hormonal birth control. So a lot of people will experience weight gain when they go on birth control, and it could be because of increased appetite, but it could also be because of the changes in estrogen and progesterone, because both of those hormones do impact the way that you store weight. Um, so there's not much you can do in terms of once you're on birth control to change its effects on your um, metabolism. Like, I guess you can change your behaviors around it, or you can try to find different forms of birth control that don't have that effect on you because it does not have the same effect on every person taking it. So I guess you kind of have to be the scientist of your own body and figure out what forms of birth control work best for you in that sense. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for being here and doing this workshop with us. I, I this was and they need to join your podcast. And, and hope that everybody that was on here, I already purchased the book. book. I, I can't wait to bring it to y'all when I see y'all in a couple months and have y'all yeah. sign it. So, <laughs> 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 all 
Oh my gosh. Yeah, guys, Amy is coming on our podcast. So please, if you come for us, come for Amy because she's coming on very soon. And thank you guys for being such a responsive audience. It's always so fun when people actually ask questions and respond. Um, you guys are awesome. Sounds great. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. And, and stay in touch. We're, we're Bye -bye. easy to reach and we'd love to hear from folks.